Okay, so this week's lab, we're gonna be working on gas chromatography. So what is the main usefulness of gas chromatography? It is wonderful for separating mixtures of volatile compounds that are close in boiling point. And it can be used in either preparative gas chromatography, which separates relatively large volumes of sample, anywhere from 25 to 100 microliters, or quantitative gas chromatography, where you're aiming to identify the components of a mixture containing a very, 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 very small amount of sample. You can measure anywhere around the microgram amounts of sample using gas chromatography if your detector is properly calibrated. So for the two compounds that we're gonna look at for the first part of gas chromatography, we're gonna look at the separation of cyclohexanol, which is an alcohol, and heptanol, which is an aldehyde. As we notice, these two compounds have a very, very small difference in boiling point. So you would really not want to try and separate these compounds via distillation. However, looking at these two structures, what do we notice is different about these two compounds? Do they have the same or different intermolecular forces? Do they have the same or different intermolecular forces? Different, right, exactly. Cyclohexanol engages in hydrogen bonding, while heptanol engages in primarily dipole-dipole interactions. So in this experiment, in the first part of this experiment, we're gonna take a 50% mixture by volume of each of these components, and we're going to separate it via preparative gas chromatography. Note, this is a 50-50 mixture by volume. Okay, so we take our syringe and we inject it into the injection port. The, the column in the injection port are heated, so the samples will vaporize. Now, we have a carrier gas that pushes our sample through a column, which is warmed with an oven. And as our sample exits the column, it passes through a detector. This detector measures and provides a signal based on the amount of compound passing through the detector, more specifically the concentration in terms of mass over volume. We will then, whenever we observe a signal, we will collect a sample and we will collect two fractions of our mixture as they elute from the column. We'll call these fractions A and B. Each of these fractions will leave the column because they're different compounds, they elute or they leave the column at different retention times. Does that make sense so far? So preparative gas chromatography can be used to separate mixtures. We're gonna separate our mixtures of cyclohexanol and heptanol we will observe when we detect our samples leaving the column and we'll collect the fraction from the column. Additionally, when we collect our two fractions, so let's suppose we have our two, our two um, test tubes containing A and B. We're gonna be able to record the mass of sample for sample A and B. That's the first piece of data you're gonna get from the video. Then what you're going to do as part of your first set of calculations, you're gonna calculate the initial mass of sample using the equation density is equal to mass over volume. And we can rearrange this equation to the initial mass of the sample is the density times the volume. Make sure your volume is converted to milliliters. Now that we have our initial mass and the mass of our sample, what we can do for each of our mixture components is we can calculate the mass percentage, which is equal to the mass of our sample over the mass initial. 
This is defined more accurately as what's called the percent recovery after a separation. What you're also going to do is you're going to calculate the mass over mass percentage of each component by taking the mass of component A over the mass of component A plus the mass of component B times 100%. So from your raw mass data, you'll record and you'll complete the following set of calculations. Does that make sense to everyone? What you're doing with the raw mass data? Okay, so going back to this idea of the detector, the gas chromatography instrument, the detector in this case is thermal conductivity. And essentially, it measures the changes in resistance as samples pass through the detector. The more sample we have, the greater the signal we observe. So a signal is observed when our compound passes through the detector. And in turn, our, we observe a signal as a function of time. OK? So we observe a different signal as a function of time as our sample slowly passes past the detector. Now, the peak size, this peak area, is proportional to the mass of our sample. It's not exactly equal. You need to do a calibration curve for that. But it's proportional to the mass of compound. So then, By analyzing the peaks and analyzing the detector output, we can in turn estimate the amount and the mass of each sample isolated. More on that later. Now, to unpack a little bit about how gas chromatography actually separates compounds, you have your sample in the vapor phase and it's in equilibrium with the sample in the liquid phase. So the sample passes through the column and it will periodically condense and deposit on the stationary phase. This stationary phase is typically a liquid or other compound that is bound to the column surface. And our compound will interact with our stationary phase based on the intermolecular forces, column temperature, and flow rate. So by designing and picking the correct stationary phase, you can select for interactions with different compounds. So I would encourage you when you write your report to figure out the coding and figure out the structure of these different stationary phases that we use in our separation. Does that hint make sense to everyone? If you want to rationalize and understand your separation efficiencies, it may be good to understand exactly what the structure and formula of our stationary phase components are. So does this idea make sense? So our compound elutes through the column, it will periodically interact with our stationary phase, and the degree of interaction with the stationary phase depends on the intermolecular forces between our compound and the stationary phase and the column temperature and flow rate. So the flow rate represents how quickly the carrier gas is pushing our compounds through the column, while the temperature is just the, the temperature that the oven is heated to. Both of these factors dramatically impact your separation. So when we think about high flow rate, high flow rate decreases retention time and may result in decreased resolution if compounds cannot establish equilibrium with the stationary phase. So if we're pushing our compounds through the column really quickly with a high flow rate, of course our compounds will leave the column faster. However, it also pushes 
the gap between our compounds closer together. So our peaks will appear closer together. And we really want to make sure that our peaks are separate and resolved enough that we can distinguish the peak areas from each other. Okay, so let's keep going with this. So at high temperatures, high temperatures also decrease the retention time because our compounds will spend less time interacting with our stationary phase. Now, high temperatures aren't entirely bad because high boiling compounds may give broad peaks if the temperature is not high enough. So if we look at a low temperature run, and if we increase our temperature and we look at a high temperature run, we can improve our peak width by adjusting the temperature of our oven. The overall programming for a gas chromatography instrument oven is quite sophisticated, so you can carefully control the oven temperature. Okay. So that is how the gas chromatography column can actually separate our compounds. Let's talk now about how to analyze our peaks. So here's an example of a fully worked out peak. There are a few things to keep in mind and a few pieces of data that we are going to need to record. The first of which is the peak width. The second of which is the retention time. And the final piece of information that we'll need is the height. So to unpack how to calculate the peak width and retention time, you're going to want to look at your peak and you're going to want to identify You're going to want to identify the point of inflection, which is the point where the slope of your peak changes. So for example, in the following curve, we've identified the following inflection points. Now what we're going to do is we're going to draw two tangent lines shown in blue. These tangent lines will intersect these tangent lines will intersect the x axis and will record these two time values. The peak width is defined as the starting and ending elution times of our peak obtained from the tangent lines. Additionally, if we look at the point where our two tangent lines intersect, this time in the middle of our peak where our two tangent lines intersect is known as the retention time TR. So from each of our peak plots, we'll be able to obtain the retention time and the peak width. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that process make sense? Does this process of drawing the tangent lines and identifying the peak width and retention time make sense? Now, from, from our peak width, so from our peak width and from our retention time, we can calculate the number of theoretical plates. So just like in a distillation, we can calculate the number of theoretical plates found in our gas chromatography column. And the number of theoretical plates is defined as 16 times the retention time over the peak width squared. Now the number of theoretical plates is useful, but each chromatography column can have slightly different lengths. And in order to directly compare chromatography columns and in order to compare the separation efficiency of different chromatography columns, we instead use the height equivalent theoretical plates, which is defined as the length over the number of theoretical plates. Height equivalent theoretical plates 
provide us a standardized metric to compare the separation efficiencies of different columns. Okay, so does that make sense in terms of the data that we can collect from each peak? Now, we know previously, so we know previously that one from each of our isolated samples, we can calculate the mass of our sample. We can calculate the percent recovery by taking the mass of the sample over the mass initial. We can also calculate the mass over mass percent by taking the mass of sample A over the mass of sample A plus the mass of sample B times 100%. Wonderful. Now, that's the data that we can get from our isolated mass. From our gas chromatography detector output, from our gas chromatogram, we can actually extract and collect data relating to the mass percentage and the mass of each sample. Okay, so the way that we do that, first and foremost, we identify our two inflection points. So we identify T1, T2, and our retention time. Okay. So unpacking this peak a little bit, unpacking this peak a little bit, there are two main metrics that we can use. There are two main metrics that we can use to calculate area. The first of which is peak width which is defined as T2 minus T1. The other metric is known as the width at one half height, which is defined as the peak width of our sample at half height. Once we have the peak width and the width at half height, we're then gonna measure our peak height H. The peak area is defined as either the width at one half height times the height, or the area can also be calculated by using one half times the peak width times the height. Both of these methods are valid. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Okay, I, yes, I do want you to use both methods for the peak area calculation. So now that we have the peak area, we can calculate the area over area percent, which is approximately equivalent to the mass over mass percent. Now the area of over area percent is defined as the area of sample A divided by the area of sample B plus the area of sample A times 100%. And your goal is to calculate the area over area ratio and compare it to the mass over mass ratio for each of our peak mixtures. Does that make sense? Does that idea make sense? Perfect. So as our final step, we are going to assign the identity of each peak 
using the tabulated retention time and the physical properties. And that is really it for today's lab. So to help everyone understand how to do the calculations, I prepared a sample chromatogram, which is a printout very similar to what you'd be seeing um, if you analyze the data provided from this lab. And I'll show you an example run through of how to analyze the data and complete the calculation. So first and foremost, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to identify my two tangent lines. This peak is relatively sharp, so it's not too much of a pain to figure out the tangent line. Okay, so now I'm going to record both of my both of my times. So T2 is about 7.4 minutes. Uh, T1 is about 5.8 minutes. So then my peak width will be defined as 7.4 minus 5.8, which would give me about 1.6. Does that make sense so far? Does that make sense so far? You may want to follow along with your own chromatogram. Your chromatogram may look a little bit different, but this process is the same. Next, we're going to identify our retention time, which is the point where our two tangent lines intersect and can also be thought of as the middle of our peak. So in this case, our retention time is about 6.2 minutes. Okay, we're then gonna record the peak height. The height is approximately 6.8. The units are millivolts, but we typically omit these output units for peak height. And now, so at half height, half height would then be 3.4. So we find 3.4. And then we calculate the peak width. So we have, so width at one half height, we have about 6.1 minus 6.9, which gives us 0 0.8. Okay, so we now have enough data to calculate our area. So our area would be the height, which is 6.8 times one half times the width, which is 1.6. Another calculation for the area would be the width at one half height, which is 0 0.8 times the height, which is 6.8. And in this case, both of our calculations result in a peak area of 5.4. We can also calculate our number of theoretical plates by taking 16 times the retention time over the peak width squared. Uh, just to look at the chat, uh, you record the peak height at the height of the function. So the peak height is different from the tangent line intersection. 
So now calculating our number of theoretical plates, we take our retention time, which is 6.2 over our peak width, which is 1.6 squared. So we have 6.2 over 1.6 squared times 16. And that gives us a number of theoretical plates of 240. Repeating this calculation for our second peak, does this first set of calculations make sense? Does what we've computed for our first set of peaks make sense? Okay, so let's move on to the second peak then. We draw our tangent line. Okay, so we have, oops, this should be a little bit less. So we have 13.2 is T2, 10.9 is T1. So our peak width would be 13.2 minus 10.9. which gives us a peak width of 2.3 minutes. Now, continuing on, we can get our retention time. And in this case, our retention time would be equal to 11.8 minutes. Next, we're going to record the peak height. Okay, so our height is approximately 5.8 millivolts. So one half height would be equal to 2.9 millivolts. So we find 2.9, we trace across to 2.9, and now we record the width at one half height. So the width at one half height would be 11.1 .1 minus 12.2, which gives us 1.1 minutes. Now we can calculate the area. So the area one would be the height, which is 5.8 times one half times the width. And that in turn gives us an area of 6.7. Our area calculated through, through our alternative method we take the width at one half height, which is 1.1 times the height. And that in turn gives us 6.4. Okay, so now to show an example of the area over area percent, we're gonna take the area of peak one, make sure that when you're calculating the area over area percent, that you keep the areas for separate methods separate. 
So we have the areas from method one. So we'll label this arbitrarily A and B. So the area over area percent for peak A would be calculated to be 5.4 over 6.7 plus 5.4. Give me a moment, I'm just entering in the calculator. That in turn gives us a area over area percent of 45%. For peak B, our area over area percent would be 6.7 over 6.7 plus 5.4 times 100%. And if we punch that into our calculator, that gives us an area over area percent of 55%. And you'd compare these area over area percents to your mass percentages. Note, peak area over area may not directly match your mass over mass percents because different samples have different detector response ratios. And we didn't make a calibration curve for this experiment because we're really just looking for the approximate peak areas. Does this idea make sense? Does this lab make sense to everyone now? Perfect. So this is a good opportunity for us to stop the recording.